Uh, joining in with us, and we're so thankful for that. And, uh, and ever since COVID, we've had some folks even listen in and give an ear from around the country. So uh, we say hello, and, uh, and thank you for uh, chiming in today. Uh, but today, we start a brand new series. Uh, we start a brand new series on the book of Jonah, and uh, it's one of my favorite books in the Bible. It's one of my favorite stories to go through, and it is utterly unique uh, in its... Um, is placed in the, in the Old Testament canon. It's very exciting to go through. If, just by show of hands for people in the room, if you are familiar, or if you read through the book of Jonah, just raise your hand for a second. Yeah, most of us are familiar with the book of Jonah. And, and I titled this, you know, I have a couple of subtitles here, Jonah in the belly of the beast or in the belly of the fish, uh, when your will and God's will collide. So despite the, the art, the wonderful art that you c can kind of see there with a person in the, in the midst of a, of a fish, the belly of a fish, this is unique not because, or not simply because of the part the fish plays in this story. It's not unique just because of that. That's not actually what I mean. There's something actually more unique about this book, which is more telling to the point and what it means for our lives. When you look at this story, uh, let me just lay the, the, uh, the framework or lay out some, just some groundwork here for you to appreciate is it exactly what I'm appreciating here. Think about this. You have five major prophets in the Old Testament and 11 other minor prophets, 12 minor prophets if you include Jonah. And all of them focus on what most of these Old Testament books tend to focus on, which is what? A revelatory message that God has provided for the people of Israel or for the people of Judah, looking at the different tribes. See, all of these prophetic words, they focus in on a particular message that's to go to the people of God. Isaiah, for instance, it focuses on God's word to Judah about this, in, this coming um, uh, danger and this coming danger through the form of Babylonians. They're coming, and there's nothing that you can do about it because of your idolatry, and you turned away from God. God is going to do something to, to bring about discipline, to woo the hearts of his people back to him. Daniel, on the other hand, is going to focus on a message that, that is going to be given to the people of God for their encouragement, that this is not the end of the story. That God is not going to just simply leave you here, that there's a coming Messiah. And, and Isaiah, he's going to give a um, hint to that as well, of this coming Messiah in the future, that this hope that's going to be coming, but... But right now, you need to get ready for the reality of destruction that's coming upon you, right? Jonah, on the other hand, he is the only one of the prophetic books that actually doesn't focus on a particular message, though there is a message there. It doesn't focus on the message. The, the, the primary content of the book is not about the message from God. It's actually centered on a person, which is very abnormal when you look at the Old Testament prophetic books. See, that gives us a hint as to what it means for us because we're going to begin to see here that it's going to focus on the stuff of humanity. See, it's going to focus on a person who struggled with things that we all can probably raise our hands at at any particular moment throughout the sermon and say, yep, I, I amen that, Pastor. I'm struggling with that right now. See, it's so, it focuses on Jonah and his struggle with anger, his struggle with hate and bitterness, it's the stuff of humanity. It's the, it's the stuff that he's dealing with as it pertains to even dissatisfaction in his life and, and what God has said, and, and I don't want to do this thing, Lord. And it's all these things that he's struggling with in his heart, what we're going to essentially be looking at is we're going to be looking at ourselves. We're going to be looking at the things that we struggle with, and we're going to be stirring our own humanness in the face. This is why this book is so important in the Old Testament canon. And not just that, even more important than that is that not only are we looking at ourselves and looking at in the mirror in this, we're going to be looking at how God actually engages this. Thus, we're going to be learning something about the character of God. You see why this is so important? You see God and you see human and you see struggle and you see God's response all in this book and what God does and how God responds 
when his will and his call collides with our will. This is a very important book, and, and as we explore the depth of us, may we explore the depth of God, the depth of God as well. And th- today, we're going to break this up in four different parts. Today, we're going to learn something about the character of God. And what are we going to learn about the character of God? As we start this book, we're going to learn this, and I want you to hone in on this message today, okay? God's love goes far beyond what we can expect for ourselves and far more than we can expect for others. That's what we're going to see in terms of God's character. It goes far more and far beyond what we can expect for ourselves. And, and we have to often get this, this, um, th- this reminder of what the gospel has to say to us and what the message of the gospel is to us and to people that are in desperate need of God's love. But it also is far me, uh, beyond, and it goes, it's far more than what we can expect for other people, and we're going to be talking about that. So let's go ahead and jump into this visible representation of the gospel as we look at the book of Jonah. Let me go ahead and read for us. So you can just follow along on the, uh, on the screen here. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 17 of chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from, and what is your country, and what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord and the God of heaven, and who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then he said to him, then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rolled hard to get back to dry land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood for you. O Lord, have done as please. O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from his raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days, and three nights. This is the word of the Lord. The first thing that we're going to focus on today is we're going to look at the the character of grace. Don't forget that when we're looking at this book, it is unique in the fact that it focuses on a person, and we get to see something about humanity, and we also get to see something about the character of God. And so we're focusing on what the character of God, what this characteristic is that's coming out from this story. And the first thing we're going to look at is the character of grace. Let's look at verses 1 through 2. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now, here's something that verses 1 and 2 tells us. 
it tells us here that the word of God, it comes to uh, the prophet Jonah. And Jonah up until this point, if you, do, if you don't know anything else about Jonah, there's one other place in the Old Testament where Jonah is actually mentioned. He's mentioned in 2 Kings 14.25. In the place where he's mentioned, he's actually having a successful prophetic ministry. The brother is having a good banging church ministry. Uh, he wasn't at a, a particular one place, but he was going around, and God is going around the country, and God was giving him good news. He was giving him what Christians call the gospel news. He gave good news to King Job, uh, Jeroboam to say, hey, guess what? You can go ahead and start rebuilding your walls. Don't worry. Nobody else is going to come in and tear them down. Now new life is coming in. The, this is the gospel for the, the, for the kingdom of Judah. This is gospel good news. That's what gospel means, good news. It's life rejuvenating news. And so he had a pretty good, I mean, you like giving good news, right? Who wants to be the bearer of bad news? Even when I was hiring and firing, I don't want to give bad news. You know, most people that like giving bad news, it's probably something wrong. It's probably something a little off, but they, they can be very um, necessary sometimes. Um, hopefully not in your lives. But you, you have here, he's giving good news to Judah. And so in this, we learn something even about the grace and the character of God, that God is giving good news through the ministry of Jonah, but God has some more news to give to Jonah. He tells Jonah to do something on behalf of the Ninevites. But before we go on, let me, let me go ahead and define grace this way. This is the operating definition that I will be using for grace Grace may be defined as the unmerited or undeserving favor of God to those who are under condemnation or facing condemnation. See, grace and good news is good news in light of the bad news. It's, it's good news to Judah at this point because they don't have to be paranoid that another bigger and better uh, a country and empire is going to come through their walls. So go ahead and start building them. Well, there's some grace and there's some good news and there's something that God is going to give to, to Jonah on behalf of some other people, an, another ethnicity, namely the Syrians. He says that I have a, some news that I want to give to you on behalf of the Ninevites and it's a new, some news of warning to them. Their evil has come before me. And, and, and what does he specifically, specifically say? Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now, the question that you should probably start asking yourself right now is that why would God give him a message to give them, give to the Ninevites, if his plans were simply to destroy them for their great evil? Right? He's giving them a chance. He's giving them a warning, and Jonah picks it up quickly because we're going to see his, his, his reaction really quick here. But, but it's a message of warning and something that you should know about the Ninevites. The Ninevites, that's, Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrians. And if you want to know what the Assyrians, who the Assyrians are, they were on record historically one of the most gruesome people that had ever lived. When you look at the historical records, at the things that he used to do, this idea of baby dashing, you can look it up and Google it. I won't go into details here. What they did to their enemies, what they did to people that were on the inside in order to make sure that there was social order in the place, and what they did to send messages was absolutely appalling, and other countries around them looked upon them with great fear. This is one of the reasons why when the, the Babylonians come, they want to do away with the Syrians because they were some cruel people. So this message is going to the capital city of Nineveh before they become this great empire. Okay, well, we're going to see why this may be such a, a big deal to, uh, to Jonah. But we learn that God's grace, it moves. We learn here that God's grace, it pursues we learn here that God's grace is not something that he simply wanted to tell you. You're not going to get grace until you come and get it from me in terms of like come into the church and come to this place. God comes after us with his grace. This is why he's sending the prophet of God. This is why he sends and dispatches, dispatches his people in the world that they may share his grace that is verbal in action, is in action. He pursues us with his grace because he loves us and God is going to work through Jonah. We learn something about the character of God's grace through the warning that he gives. So our story starts today with the word of the Lord coming to Jonah. 
But that's also a part of what complicates things, isn't it? See, we see that God has great grace, and we're going to see this here more and more. Uh, but let's go to the second point, because that's what actually complicates things. We see the character of God's grace and that it pursues and that God gives this warning. But a grace, we also see a grace that challenges our prejudice. It's a grace that challenges our prejudice. Well, what do I mean by that? Okay, verse 3. It says, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. That is a difficult word to say. Try to say that three times. As they say it over and over again here. Verse 3 tells us this. Now, do we have a map here at all? Okay, so uh, verse 3 tells us this. He says that when Jonah gets the word of God here, he tries to get as far as possible from the place where God wants him to minister and share this warning and share this message. Uh, Tarshish is situated in the ancient world in what today is modern-day Spain. All right, so he's in Israel, and he's trying to get over to Spain. Right? So he's trying to get through the Mediterranean Sea and uh, sail as far west as possible. And so he's trying to get all the way over, and, and he's not taking any chances. You know, the brother's not even stopping along the way on northern uh, shores. Like, what? North Africa is not good enough? Jesus didn't even go that far, uh, or the, uh, Mary and Joseph didn't go that far when they were trying to escape um, the, uh, the, people, the uh, king of uh, Israel. He goes 2,500 miles in the opposite direction. Now, in order to pull something off like this, now listen to this, because now we're going to get to something about us. Let's, stare, let's see if we can see ourselves in the mirror here. In order to pull something off like this, you have to believe two lies. One, that God is not good. And two, God is escapable. Those are the two things that you will have to believe in order to believe that you can go any amount of miles to get away from God. And, and I think this is what we, we see in terms of what sin is and what transgression is. It's exactly that. It's the belief in any given moment that, Lord, I don't want to do this thing that you're requiring of me because we don't believe that God is good. And somehow, by not doing it, we can evade God. See, when we disobey the teachings of our Lord in the areas of, of marriage and conflict, our finance and trust, our parenting and faithfulness, anger and forgiveness, lust and self-control, those are, are, are examples of areas where we can declare these two lies in our life. When we disobey, we are not believing that God is actually good. And are we not believing what Jonah believed here? Let me just handle it this way, or let me just handle it the way I want to handle it. Let me just do it the way I want to do it. And when I do it, God doesn't really see it. And so we should look deep and deeper into this text. What's the bigger issue going on here? Well, I mean, what, what, what's, why is he running? I said that this grace, it challenges our prejudice this is a very important point because this is all over this text. Why does Jonah run? Why does he run as opposed to just simply being obedient and doing what God called him to do as he was doing with King Jeroboam and the like? Well, there's something else that you need to notice here. See, the apostle Peter struggled with the same exact thing that that Jonah is struggling with right now, and it's very interesting, and I don't think it's coincidental, that it's from the same place, geographically. Right here, he's coming from the city of Joppa, which is also the same place where Peter receives a word from God in Acts chapter 10 to go and proclaim the gospel to people that didn't look like him and that weren't supposed to get the word of God according to their own customs, according to their own prejudices. God tells Peter that, Peter, I'm going to give you this vision. And Peter, guess what? You are used to eating uh, Jewish food. What is Jewish food called? What is it called? Kosher. kosher. Yeah, kosher. He says, brother, you're about to start eating some ribs here for a second. God gives him this vision to eat some pork, to, to do something. And he says to God, I have never eaten anything unclean, Lord. No, but God is giving him a vision that now is time for the gospel to go to the Gentiles. 
And they don't have to become Jewish in order to get my love. They can be who they are and allow me to transform them in their own context. It's the same exact issue going on. There is ethnocentrism going on. Same location is from Joppa, same calling to the Gentiles, and same fear, ethnocentrism. That God is only for me. And Lord, listen, we, you might not know this history, but King Jeroboam is probably one of the worst kings that ever existed in, the, in, the, in Judah. Sinful man who brought idolatry to his own people. But it, it didn't seem to bother um, my, our brother Jonah all that much. He still preached the good news to him. Ah, but what about if the person is different from me? What if the person is not of my tribe? What if they're different? Then there becomes a bigger issue. And God is going to challenge that. God's love is nothing short of scandalous to the human mind. How God can love us unconditionally and how God can love our enemy unconditionally. See, we see that God's grace, it extends way beyond what we could hope or even sometimes want for other people. See, Jonah knows this, and he runs because he knows to tell them is to warn them, and to warn them is to essentially give them a chance to repent and turn away where they receive the favor of God. And how many of us want the favor of God for an enemy? How many of us want the favor of God and want God to do something in the hearts of people that we don't particularly like? How often do we even pray for our enemy? Yeah, this is hard stuff, and it wasn't easy when Jesus taught it. It's not easy even in this first century, as I said, even this morning. It's not easy for the man that's even standing at this podium right now. See, God is going to tell him to go outside of his tribe. Let me give you a quick illustration. I was doing some reading um, this uh, earlier uh, last week and through a book that I'm going through, and we're coaching some folks through uh, this book. And uh, he talks about um, this French sociologist that, that talks about tribes. He says uh, one of the fundamental differences with how people form tribes uh, from yesteryear to uh, this year is that it's not primarily centered or dependent upon geography. And yes, your, your, your tribe was determined by where you lived, where you grew up, and what your family did, okay? With urbanization, you're increasingly it becomes the case that your tribe is more chosen. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't grow up in certain places. You don't identify with the places you grew up in. But increasingly, in places like the Bay Area and other big cities, you may say that, look, man, I grew up in the middle of the hood, but I vibe like a hipster. You know, if that's your thing, then that would be your thing, <laughs> You may say that, hey, I grew up in the country, but I love hip-hop, right? You begin to choose your own tribe. And as a matter of fact, he begins, the sociologist even goes further and says that every tribe has a narrator that they listen to, and when they face different issues coming across their screens or coming across their, their, their mind gate, they typically ask the question, what does this narrator have to say about it? What are they actually asking? What do we believe about this? What does my tribe believe about this? We all have tribes that we are either born into or that we choose that we ought to be mindful of. And he sees the tribe. In tribalism, it can be very dangerous. Now, it doesn't mean that tribes are, um, are wrong in and of themselves, but they can be very dangerous when it contradicts God's love and God's grace. See, God reaches across Lines and across those tribal lines. And I want to make sure I lay that before us today as we're thinking about this. See, Jonah suffered from this tribalism and said, and he believed in his mind that no, surely not them. He suffered from a but I syndrome, but I don't want it to go to them. And maybe you suffer from a but I syndrome this morning. But I don't want my wife to have grace. But I can accept that this works like that and that, God, you will give them forgiveness. But I can't accept God's grace even for myself. I want to tell you to speak to those but voices in your, in your life and heed and hear God's grace and God's loving message because we're going to learn something even more about God's character and the character of God's grace today. See, we're going to learn here that the grace of God, it is greater 
than we can ever imagine, but it's also costly. Let me go to our third point here. And right here we see that there's a free cost of God's grace. Let's read what happens next after Jonah tries to run away from God and believing those two lies, what God is going to do as he's going to pursue Jonah. Verse 4 tells us that, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. The mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship and to the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and what people are you? Now there you go. You, you have some bold stuff going on in this story. It says that the brother went down into the ship and went to sleep. Now, that reminds me of uh, someone else that went into the inner part of the sleep to go to sleep during the middle of a storm. Uh, who was that? That was Jesus. That happened with Jesus, right? I can understand him. Now, if I was in the ship with Jesus, I was like, brother, you, why are you sleeping in the middle of a storm? Come on, Jesus, you got to wake on up. But he went in the middle of the ship, and he went to sleep, and they cannot understand what he is doing. It is um, irrational to them. What are you doing? And they begin to investigate, like, brother, get up. You ain't by yourself because that's what happens when we begin to isolate ourselves from, from God's word and from God's command in our life. We become to isolate and, and become relationally distant. And we're like, do you understand what you are doing and how it's affecting other people? They don't know this yet. They don't know it's him, but they don't understand why are you so separated from what's going on right now. I think that he had made a complete disconnect from the world, from everything, and he went down to the ship and he went to sleep. And I can picture this conversation going on on the ship here while, as they're talking to one another. These are people that, that they went to the sea all the time. They were seamen. They're in the ship uh, in, in, this, uh, this context, in this context, and they're in the ship, and they see this mighty tempest that goes and hits the, uh, which is a mighty wind that hits the, the water. They probably hadn't seen uh, anything like this up until this point because they really felt and really thought they were going to die to the point that they're crying out to deity. And they begin to um, ask Brother Jonah, Brother, who are you and what is going on? I think his, his uh, reply is something that we should learn from. What does he say? He says that I'm a, I'm a Hebrew the story tells us that he tells them specifically that he's running from them, but then he says something specifically about his God. And what does he say about his God? He says, my God is the God of the what? Land and the what? And the sea. That my God is not just a God that's just simply uh, this God of this, um, uh, this uh, polytheism where you have God assigned, God's assigned to different areas of existence. No, my God is the God of the universe. He's the God of all. And it says that once he actually proclaimed that truth, they became exceedingly afraid. There's something that we learn about God's grace, this God who's the God of all, that though God's grace is free, it is costly. Though God's grace is free, it is costly. I'm going to read this, this, uh, this, this text in Proverbs in Hebrews. You'll see exactly what I mean when I say this. Proverbs thir uh, chapter 3, verse 12 says this, Because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. There's something going on that tells us that God is pursuing after Jonah, and he won't allow him to get away because Jonah wants to just separate and get away from God. Hebrews 12, 6 tells us that because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son and as daughters. You see something here about the character of God's grace and about the fact that God's grace, though it is free, it is undeserved, it is unmerited, but though God gives it, it is something else about the grace of God that is important here. And God's grace, it pursues us as we read above, but it pursues us even when we run. 
See, that's the beauty about the gospel here, and that's the beauty about God's love for us, is that even when we want to say that, Lord, I don't want anything else to do with this, it is too hard to accept these teachings, and it's too hard what you're calling me to do, and and I don't want to do it, and I don't want to love this way, and I don't want to do this thing anymore. Even in the 21st century, it becomes increasingly unpopular to believe certain things that God will call humanity to believe in order for us to know what it means to have true life, to have true purpose, and to have a flourishing relationship with the God of the universe. It becomes more and more costly to an opposing culture that sees it, sees it as outdated, as bigotry, or as contradictory to their definition of human flourishing. And sometimes we find ourselves wanting to run away from God and run away from his, his commands in our life and run away from what he has for us, believing those two lies and believing that we can get away from it. But God is not like humanity, and he's not like our greatest relationship, praise the Lord. Because even our greatest relationships, we see that those relationships are filled with people that have clay feet. God is not like humanity Praise the Lord that we get to be like him. But that is to say that, listen, I'm going to be honest. Let me just be real with you. There's times throughout the week that my wife makes me upset, and I don't want to pursue after her. I want to just cross my fingers and cross my, or cross my, my arms and say that, okay, you made me mad, so you're going to have to pursue after me now. Right? There's sometimes in, 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 in life where, where people, uh, they, they create a relational violation uh, maybe they made us angry, or maybe someone says something, and, and we, we run away, or we go away from them. We leave our churches, we go away from people, and we wash, other people, we wash our hands and say, that, okay, well, you ran away, that's on you. We want to be selfish with our love, we want to be gods of our own love, and typically that translates to us not pursuing. Look at what God does. Proverbs and Hebrews and other texts like it tells us that God pursues because he does love. And even when we want to run away from him, his love tells us that I won't allow you to get away. Jeremiah and other prophets, they they speak to this very concept of of when they wanted to get away, you didn't let me get away. Lord, you, you forced yourself upon me. You didn't let me get away from you. Ezekiel tells us that even when he wanted to stop speaking, that God wouldn't allow him to stop speaking. Oh, there are times that preachers want to just stop and not say and and not believe certain things because it's going to bring us about a certain amount of controversy. But Lord, you've been too good to me for me to be silent on your word. And even if I wanted to run away, you love me too much. You think if Mara and Justice said, Daddy, I'm done with you and ran away from me, you think I'm going to say, okay, well, fine. My legs are longer, I'm stronger, and I can reach them. And God will reach you when you run. I love what uh, the English theologian A.J. Gossip Gossip, uh, has to say about this. He says, if we are whimpering and sniveling and begging to be spared the discipline of life that is sent to knock something smatterings or some smatterings of manhood and and womanhood into us, the answer to that prayer may never come at all. Thank God, he says. If you are not bleeding to get off, this is old English, like what is he saying here? Let the context give meaning to the word he's saying here. But asking to be given grace and strength to see this through with honor, the very day you pray that prayer, the answer always comes. That is to say that, listen, Discipline will come in your life, and that is a part of God's grace in your life. And God pursues through discipline. And Jonah is going to learn this firsthand, even when we try to run away from God. He won't allow us to get away. It's a costly grace because it's not something that is simply um, cheap and inexpensive, where we can just say, yes, God, uh, I want everything good from you. But anything that costs me, I don't want. No, God loves you too much to allow that to happen. He's going to pursue you. He loves you, and he pursues us through discipline, which I'm thankful that we learned something else even about grace and about the character of God in his grace this morning. And not only do we see that, listen, you see something about the character of grace that is undeserved, is unmerited. 
Uh, not only do you see something about the fact that God's grace, it challenges us, and it challenges our prejudice in this life, which often we find ourselves wanting to run and escape the word of God. We also see that, that God's grace is costly, though it is free, because it pursues after us when we try to run from it. But also we see something about the fact that God's grace, it also cures as well. Grace and grace and grace, which is why I've titled this sermon, Greater Grace, is all over this text, a text that we typically assign or associate with simply running and being in the belly of a well. It first starts with God's grace, a message with the potential of grace and a message of grace that pursues. Let me read that for us as we close our time today. It says in verse 9, and he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea of, and the dry land. We cover that there. Talks about them being exceedingly afraid. Let's pick up in verse 11. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done as it has pleased you. Let's stop right there. Let me just uh, summarize what just is going on here. After they hear about what this man is running from and what he told them and, and why the, temp the tempest has come upon them and why you have all this wind and them being tossed to and fro on the, the ocean there, they begin to say, he says, hey, throw me over. Now, that's a, that's, that may be a beautiful sign of one coming to the end of themselves, but you also see a person that knows that what needs to happen, but he can't bring himself to do it himself. But he's not going to do it. He says, listen, throw me over the side. And you see that they even see the power of God where they like, look, I'm not a, I'm not a Hebrew. Or let me put it in today's term. I'm not a Christian, but I can tell that God is real and God is real in your life. Right? They become the more faithful adherents to the word of God in this moment. To the point where they don't even want to anger God. They say that, look, man, look, before we throw you over, what we're going to do is that we're going to keep on trying to row to make sure that that's the last resort. That's what they're doing. They're trying their best to honor God more than the, per the prophet of God. And so when they see that this is not going to, God's like, nah, not going to happen. You can't row against my will here. Not going to happen. When your will and my will collide, Jonah. When our wills collide with the will of God, we will not win that 10 times out of 10. And you have them, they throw him over, begging that the Lord would not throw that, that blood on them. And immediately when that happens, it ceases, and then they offer uh, worship to God. They offer sacrifice to God. So let me go ahead uh, and end our time on this ideal of a grace that cures I don't think that God is here is interested in punishing Jonah. What I'm talking about this morning is not about punishment. There's something fundamentally different uh, between punishment and discipline. He's interested in disciplining jo uh, uh, Jonah in order to cultivate and rot, W-R-O-U-G-H-T, rot in Jonah's heart, something that is necessary in order to put him back on stable ground and Jonah can't do that himself. We can't do that ourselves. Only God can put the right, beautiful life cocktail together in order to get our hearts in the place that it's supposed to be in. So let me uh, talk about some fundamental differences between punishment and discipline. Uh, before I go over this, this, uh, this, this uh, graph here, uh, let me just say here... Um, that the ideal punishment implies repaying someone with what he or she deserves. That's the ideal. That's the heart of punishment. I'm repaying for what you have done to me. That's the antithesis of the gospel. God is not simply trying to simply punish his people, right? Punishment produces a child. If you were looking at it uh, with a child in a parent relationship, punishment produces a child with guilt and determined to get out from, un uh, from under it. 
So punishment produces a child laden with guilt and determined to get out from under. The child doesn't want to be under that guilt, but it produces within that child something that is laden with guilt. The child is laden with guilt, and Christ-likeness is never the result. An effective parent has to learn the difference between punishment and discipline as God is. So let's look at some of the differences here between punishment and discipline. So the purpose of punishment is to inflict penalty for an offense, but discipline is to train for correction and maturity. The focus of the, of the two are different. The focus of punishment is past misdeeds. I'm going to focus on what you did to me, and I can't get over what you did to me in the past, what you just did to me or what you... The focus of discipline is actually future-oriented. I'm not doing this because of what you did. I'm doing this because I'm trying to do something with your heart because of where you're headed, and I can see this is where you're headed. The attitude between the two are different. The attitude of punishment is hostility and frustration on the part of the parent, but the discipline, uh, the attitude of discipline is love and concern on the part of the parent. It's not about the, the, how angry I am with you. It's about, hey, I love you, and I'm concerned for you. So if I ever have to discipline you more than justice, just remember this sermon. All right. And then lastly, resulting emotion in the child with punishment is fear and guilt. The resulting emotion in the child of God is security. And to the child that, uh, of a loving parent is security, that I feel secure, that my parent loves me so much that they won't just allow me to do anything I want, and they care about my, my future. This is some good news for us this morning. Listen, if you believe and you're just standing here with a bunch of fear and guilt right now, that's coming from the wrong place and it's not coming from God. Fear and guilt is not what God is trying to produce in your life when you are doing or when you have committed sin. God is not trying to hold your past against you. No, God loves you and he's looking at the trajectory of your life and looking at where you stand with him today. And God is doing the same thing for Jonah right now. I love you, I care for you, and I'm going to bring you back to me because what you're doing is going to end in destruction, Jonah. What do you think you're going to be doing in Spain? Huh? You think you're going to be relaxing, sipping on whatever Spaniards were sipping on at this time? No, Jonah. Your life is going to be miserable. You're not going to find joy in that place. You're going to feel that you can be fulfilled and find purpose apart from the God that made you. You won't be able to do it, Jonah. I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to bring you back to me. And we're going to see next week how powerful that is and what actually happens in the heart of Jonah and what God can do with us when he brings us to the end of ourselves and when we come to the end of ourselves. If you're here right now and you're struggling with fear and guilt, it's not coming from the place of God. God is trying to get you to a place of security, get you to the place of love, get you to a place of repentance where your future and future actions and future behavior will be more secure. And so let me land the plane on this right here. I want you to notice at least the change that we see right here in terms of what God's grace and how God's grace and his pursuing grace, what changes we see in this story. One, you see a change in the sailors. You see a change in sailors. Verse 16 tells us clearly that the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Them brothers became committed, uh, you know, proselytes before the Lord. They made vows before the God of Israel because they saw his hand. They saw him at work. And that's very interesting that when someone sees God clearly at work, what other response could there be? And they thus give an example for the believer. The unbelievers giving an example for the believer and that they become believers. And the believer is also faced with this grace that changes as well. Well, what is it? Verse 12 says that he said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this tempest has come upon you. We're not in the belly of the, of the beast yet. We're not in the belly of the fish yet. But I don't want us to miss the fact that that is a part of coming to the end of, our, of yourself. If you right now and you're here today and to this week you're like, look, for the last several weeks, Pastor, I've been tired. I've been at the end of myself. I don't have energy. I don't have the motivation to do X, Y, and Z. You may be in a better place than you you, did you imagine? I believe that God can do a lot right there, and God can do a lot in the scary places of life. 
Like, I'm, I'm afraid right now. I don't know what's going on with my faith. Whatever's going on in your life right now, that may not be the worst place to be. And the next week, we will pick up on what God can do with that place. I want you to know this about God's grace. It is effectual. It will do what it, it was sent out to do. It will accomplish what it was sent out to accomplish. It will have the calculated particular effect that is necessary to create the necessary conditions for transformation through repentance. All right. We're going to stop right there. And, uh, and pray with me. Uh, as we get ready for the next um, part of our series. But I believe that God can do a lot in this place and in our hearts in this season. And even in this season of our nation's history, in this season of your life, God can do a lot. Let me pray for us as the musicians come up right now. Let's pray. Father, I want to ask that you would do a great work in us, Lord. As we investigate the efficacy of your grace in our lives, Lord, that you will produce what is necessary for our lives and for our hearts to be humble before you. Lord, we believe that and we trust that and we pray, Lord, that you would do more of that right now in our lives, God. Lord, I also want to pray, God, that, that as we are confronted with your grace, Lord, confronted with your grace for other people, Lord, that, that before we run, Lord, that we will sit, God, and that we will battle with the tension that, Lord, I don't understand this right now. But, Lord, please help me to understand it. And I also pray, God, that if we have anyone in this place that is laden with guilt and laden with fear, that they would know that that is not coming from you. But, Lord, if it is conviction, may we respond, Lord, with a broken spirit and a contrary heart. May we respond, Lord, as children that sees the loving hand of their Father, their Heavenly Father, saying that I love you. You have gone astray. I have taken note. I see everything that you do. I see your heart. I see where you're headed. I see the tension. I even see the hurt. My job as your father is to bring you close to me because in that place is security, it is joy, it is life, it is flourishing even when you cannot see it. And so, Lord, I pray that for us in this first installment, that you would give us eyes to see and that your grace would transform us in all the ways that it needs to. Lord, do the work. Do the work that only you can. We pray all this in the name of Christ. Amen.